Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 205 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. La Presidente, the Presidentess, the First Lady of the Land. The second article of the Constitution of the United States defines the executive branch of government, all the powers it has, and the role of the chief executive, the President of the United States. But what does it have to say about the position of the president's spouse or partner? On that, the Constitution is silent. But as we're about to discover, presidential spouses have always played important roles in presidential administrations. Jeannie Abrams, a professor at the University Libraries and the Center for Judaic Studies at the University of Denver, joins us to explore the lives and work of the first First Ladies of the American Republic with details from her book, First Ladies of the Republic, Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, and Dolly Madison, and the creation of an iconic American role. Now, as we venture inside the first presidential administrations, Jeannie reveals the history behind the term First Lady. Details about how Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, and Dolly Madison shaped that position. And information about how each first First Lady organized and held her Republican court. Okay, I hope you're ready to explore the creation and evolution of the role of First Lady. Because now, it's time to meet our guest. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is a professor at the University Libraries and the Center for Judaic Studies at the University of Denver. She's also the director of the Beck Archives and DU Special Collections. Her expertise is in the history of medicine in early America and in American Jewish history. She's written several books, including Revolutionary Medicine, The Founding Fathers and Mothers in Sickness and in Health, which we discussed in Episode 5 of this podcast. And her newest book is titled First Ladies of the Republic, Martha Washington, Abigail Adams and Dolly Madison and the Creation of an Iconic American Role. Welcome back to Ben Franklin's World, Jeannie Abrams. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, we last talked four years ago when you were one of our very first guests here on this show. And when we talked, we talked about how the founding fathers and mothers had concerns about health and wellness. But here we are today for an exploration of how Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, and Dolly Madison shaped the role of the First Lady. So I wonder if you would tell us, you know, how your research interests have shifted from health and wellness to a study of the role of First Lady. Sure. My last book, Revolutionary Medicine, The Founding Fathers and Mothers in Sickness and in Health, examined the lives of several of the founders against the backdrop of 18th century medicine in America. While I was researching that book, I became fascinated with the initial First Ladies and their very vivid correspondence, which really propelled me to study their roles in more detail. All three inaugural First Ladies, Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, and Dolly Madison, had to contend really with so many heart-wrenching personal family losses and numerous bouts with ill health themselves. It really made me admire their fortitude and want to learn more about how they conducted their very public roles with all those challenges operating in the background. That sounds like a really interesting story. And I know we would love to know more about the First First Ladies, too. So why don't we dive right in? Let's talk about the position. In your book, The First Ladies of the Republic, you note that the term First Lady was not commonly used until Mary Todd Lincoln in the 1860s. So where did the term First Lady come from and what is the role that it was created to define? So since the role of First Lady was not an official role, it didn't receive an official title. But I think it's interesting to note from the first, a number of America's founders refer to the position in various ways. When John Adams was elected president, in one of his first letters to Abigail, he jokingly called her La Presidente. The initial first ladies were also sometimes referred to as the Presidentess. The term first lady may have actually stretched back at least as far as our 
third first lady, Dolly Madison. President Zachary Taylor is reputed to have referred to Dolly as, quote, the first lady of the land. And even before the appellation appeared in print in regard to Mary Todd Lincoln, it may have first been formally applied to President James Buchanan's niece, who served as his White House hostess in the late 1850s. The position of First Lady was never officially mandated by the government, but from the beginning, it really had the potential for significant influence. While it's true that some presidents and even the nation may simply have expected the First Lady to perform as a charming hostess and serve as rather a symbolic role as the wife of the head of state, something akin to a royal consort, our first three ladies all played a more active role than that. For example, Abigail Adams was probably President John Adams's most valued advisor and confidant. Right after he was elected president, John wrote to ask Abigail to come join him in Philadelphia, and he rather famously declared and rather dramatically, I never wanted your advice and assistance more in my life. Although Dolly Madison was known as an extraordinary hostess, James Madison really relied on her to cement social and political relationships and to help build his political support. She was exceptionally politically savvy. And at the time, active campaigning was considered beneath the president. So often their first ladies took a more active part. Adams and Madison in particular recognized that their first ladies were skilled politicians in their own right who had their fingers on the pulse of political issues and popular feeling. It sounds like the first ladies performed a variety of different roles and functions. And speaking of functions... The first occupants of a position are usually critical to the form and shape a position will take. So I'm really curious about Martha Washington. In 1789, Martha Washington became the first first lady. What was Washington's time like as first lady? And do we know what she thought about the position and what precedent she wanted to or hoped to set for the role? Well, let's go a little bit first into her own background and I think different pieces that helped prepare her for this role, even though obviously she didn't know that was going to be happening when she was younger. Martha Washington was born into a modestly successful Virginia planter family. As the eldest of the eight Dandridge children, she was taught from an early age to be a good domestic manager and a socially adept hostess. And when she married her first husband, Daniel Custis, she became part of the upper-class Virginia elite and colonial landed gentry. And when Daniel died, she was left probably the wealthiest widow in Virginia. And before she remarried, she actually managed his estate quite capably. Her marriage to George Washington brought him great wealth and land, which in turn enabled him in many ways to fill his economic, social, and political aspirations. So she was essential to Washington really from the beginning of their marriage. Now, what she felt about the role, I would want to say that although Martha notoriously claimed to have little interest in politics or the position of first lady, she had a very highly developed sense of responsibility, and she handled the role with her customary diligence and good cheer. She knew from the beginning that her every action would be carefully watched and weighed, and that she had now become a member of a politically elite social circle. She took, again, her duties very seriously. I think she was very thoughtful about what she did. For example, she was always simply but elegantly dressed. I think undoubtedly it was a conscious effort on her part not to mimic the elaborately jeweled ensembles of European queens. And as an experienced hostess, she presided over the many drawing rooms and dinners that were essential to what has been nicknamed the New Republican Court. And it was Martha who, along with George, began the process of developing an appropriate ceremonial style for the new nation. Again, I think she was very conscious of her actions. In the drawing rooms, Martha sat on a raised platform, but she was very careful that it was not a gilded throne like her European counterparts. And those drawing rooms helped set the ceremonial protocol for the new republic and build support for the president. And I think most Americans admired Martha in part because of her strong support for Revolutionary War veterans 
And the positive view the public had developed about her as somewhat of a heroine because she had joined her husband in every winter camp during the duration of the war. Do we have any idea what Martha Washington's day-to-day life or routine was like as First Lady? Well, when they were in New York, she certainly brought her retinue of enslaved servants with her, but she was a hard worker on her own. So she got up very early. She's said to have made coffee and tea for the family early in the day. She took some time out to read, read her Bible. I think we have a stereotype of her being kind of a rather meek, mild woman who stood beside her husband. And certainly she wasn't on the level of brilliance that I would say Abigail Adams exhibited, but she was a reader. She was a thoughtful person, and she really spent her days, most of them, preparing for events that her husband had. But she was, again, by his side all the time. Now, when we think of George Washington, we often think of the precedents he set as president of the United States that subsequent presidents have followed, like the title Mr. President. Did Martha Washington establish any precedents for future first ladies to follow? Well, one, which is not terribly significant, but it certainly was one that she opened the president's house on New Year's Day to the public. But I think that one precedent that she did set was to really be very conscious to set herself apart from what royalty would be like in the old world and try to establish again an elegant but relatively simple style that was more suitable for the new republic. Okay, what about Abigail Adams? In 1797, she became the second first lady when her husband John was elected to the presidency. What was Adams's experience as First Lady like, and how did she add to or alter the role that Martha Washington had established? Well, Abigail Adams brought great intelligence, real deep knowledge of political theory, and firsthand experience with real European courts to her position. Her apprenticeship, as I termed it in my book, began as the political partner of John Adams, one of the leading members of the Continental Congress during the American Revolution. And her political ideas developed with her encounters with European royalty in both Paris and London when John served as American emissary to France and then minister to England. She saw the royal courts firsthand and interacted with kings and queens and the members of the aristocracy in both countries. So she really had a real frame of experienced reference. She had looked with disdain at the long, drawn-out ritual she had endured in Paris and London, and especially the extravagant opulence at the court. And her long years at John's side as part of a political family partnership shaped her view about how Americans should act, and she emphasized displaying virtue and restraint. Moreover, before she became First Lady, she had actually worked side by side with Martha Washington as the wife of the Vice President of the United States, and Abigail truly considered Martha a model of proper behavior for the wife of the President. As a matter of fact, when Abigail found out that she was going to be First Lady, she really worried that her tendency to be outspoken, her frankness, if John was elected, might be an obstacle. She was worried, as she put it, that she wouldn't have enough patience, prudence, and discretion to fill such a station as well as the worthy lady. She was talking about Martha, who now holds it. And after John was actually elected, Abigail wrote her good friend, Mercy Otis Warren, that, quote, I shall feel myself peculiarly fortunate if at the close of my public life, I can retire esteemed, beloved, and equally respected with my predecessor, who was, of course, Martha Washington. The two became great friends. They had a lot in common. But in the end, I would say that Abigail was much more directly involved in politics than Martha. Abigail gave media interviews, media of the day being newspapers, and consciously tried to influence public support of her husband, the president, in the media of the day, as well as in private conversations and correspondence. Some members of the public, and certainly many Republican politicians and newspaper editors, thought she had too much influence as First Lady. 
for example, her displeasure at any of her criticism of her husband and the Republican-supported newspapers led her to urge John Adams to support the Alien and Sedition Act. So she may have been the, not may have been, she was the first first lady who actually had an influence on legislation. How did the American people respond to having such an outspoken first lady who gave her own press conferences? Well, of course, it depended if you were a Federalist or a Republican. I think the Federalists really were proud of her as a, again, very articulate, highly intelligent woman. And Republicans really thought of her as kind of a harridan who was always out to defend her husband, no matter what his actions were. Do you think Adams ever achieved the esteem and respect that she hoped to as First Lady? I believe her reputation has actually grown over the centuries, so she may not have been as appreciated. She and John probably both thought that they had not been appreciated enough for their countless sacrifices on behalf of the country. But over time, I think she has become one of the most respected First Ladies. And partly that is because We have wonderful, wonderful correspondence. She was such an articulate, engaging writer who really gives us a very intimate window and sheds light on what life was like during her time. And what about precedents? Did Adams establish any precedents for future first ladies to follow? Well, in the sense that many of our subsequent first ladies have become outspoken advocates for their husbands or for a cause. Certainly, Abigail, during the American Revolution, really advocated for the Patriot cause. She was well known in her community, and she was a very, very strong support to her husband. And again, we shouldn't minimize, she really did carry out her role with a lot of grace, elegance, very diligent, hard worker, Got rose again early, early, I think when she was in Philadelphia, was getting up at five every morning to start preparing the household for social events that her husband would host as president. And those social events were very important to the development of the early republic. Now, whereas Martha Washington and Abigail Adams assumed the role of first lady after their husbands were elected president, Jeannie argues in the First Ladies of the Republic that Dolly Madison had a very different experience. Jeannie, you make the case that Dolly Madison had the opportunity to basically intern as First Lady during the presidency of Thomas Jefferson. Would you tell us more about Madison's internship as First Lady and what prompted her to step into that role of quasi-First Lady for Jefferson? Sure, that's a very interesting question. Jefferson was a widower when he became president. His daughter, Martha Jefferson Randolph, who had a large family of her own, I believe 12 children in the end, only served as Jefferson's hostess on very limited occasions, only came out to the president's house from Virginia a few times. Jefferson's style in general was consciously less formal than Washington's had been. He wanted to make a political statement about the desired simplicity of Republican affairs. So he tended to host small dinners and mostly with men who had much in common and agreed on most political issues. But when there were women present at the generally small events he hosted, most often Dolly Madison served as hostess. So that served in many ways as her apprenticeship, so to speak, as first lady. And even then, her social grace, I would say, and her charisma helped to smooth over political differences. When Jefferson perpetrated, I guess I would say, a faux pas with the London ambassador and his wife was somewhat insulted, it was Dolly who behind the scenes repaired that situation and smoothed things over so that they could move forward. And her earlier experience as a congressional wife had served as a training ground for the future as James became more politically prominent. She learned to project an image that for the most part pleased both Federalists as well as Republicans. And her innate sociability served to draw people from all walks of life into conversation. I think we should remember that In many ways, the formation of the United States was a grand experiment, and the new capital of Washington offered a dynamic woman like 
Daly, the unprecedented chance to play a visible role in building the burgeoning city at the heart of the nation's new body politic. The nascent city had a more fluid social structure than had existed in either New York or Philadelphia. And Dolly really, once she came to Washington, immediately recognized that there was a hunger for gatherings and ceremonial rituals among the nascent city's residents. And most of them at the time were connected in some way or another with new government. You said earlier that Dolly Madison had a reputation for politicking for her husband, James Madison. And in fact, during her service as the quasi first lady to Jefferson, it seems like Dolly did politic for James to be elected as Jefferson's successor. Would you tell us how Madison politicked for her husband and what it meant for her to politic for her husband? So Dolly Madison was probably what today we would term a natural politician. She was highly sociable by nature, as well as very politically savvy. And she was often able to bring about compromise through her really robust social skills. So it made for a rather potent combination. She did actively campaign and lobby on behalf of her husband. And she appears to have always been on the lookout for ways to advance James's career. And she was particularly effective in one-on-one interactions. And because she was so charismatic, she really seems to have been very successful. For example, in his diary, John Quincy Adams noted that Dolly was advertly involved in electioneering for her husband and that she was probably what today we would have termed an unofficial campaign manager, maybe even more telling. Charles Pinckney, Madison's political rival for the presidency, was said to have once famously observed, and I'm quoting here, I was beaten by Mr. and Mrs. Madison. I might have faced a better chance if I had faced Mr. Madison alone. I'm really curious about how Dolly Madison went about politicking, because I don't see her as an Aaron Burr-like figure where she's going door to door and canvassing for votes for her husband. I have to imagine that she solicited political support in some other way. So where would Madison have had opportunities to speak about her husband, his politics, and why he should be elected president? She hosted many, many dinners and gatherings that were very, very popular. And I think it's Catherine Algor who had a very felicitous phrase that Dolly moved things forward one cup of tea at a time. So she was really very, very popular among the social set and very friendly with a number of the key politicians at the time. So I think it was very subtle. I don't think it was overt, but she had a way of kind of insinuating the outstanding characteristics of Madison to the people who mattered. And remember, we're in a time without television, without radio, without tweets, It was one-on-one interaction that moved politicians forward. I know this may be impossible to answer, but do we have any idea of what we think the impact of Madison's politicking was for James Madison? I mean, I know he wins the election of 1808, but do we know how much of his victory is attributed to Dolly Madison's efforts? Well, during the War of 1812, Dolly became really a national heroine. So even though the war was not highly successful and maybe not that popular, she was lauded for her courage staying behind at the White House, just escaping the British and escaping with a symbolically important portrait. I think it was a copy and not an original of Washington. So again, she was probably the most popular public figure at the time, and that really had a trickle-down effect for Madison. In 1808, Americans did in fact elect James Madison as their fourth president, and Dolly, who had served as the quasi-first lady for eight years, now, in 1809, became the official first lady. Jeannie, did Dolly's role change in any way when she went from being the quasi-first lady to the official first lady? Certainly, Dolly was the most flamboyant of the three first ladies, but she was able to carry off her unique, rather exuberant style. Some of her admirers referred to her as a Republican queen. Somehow, she was able to display a subtle aura of royalty, but through an American filter. 
So she was able to meld the Federalist desire for high style and the Republican emphasis on simplicity at the same time, quite a challenge. She also had a talent for reaching out to both sides of the aisle, so to speak, to both Federalists and Republicans. At the same time, she consciously worked to blend elements of aristocracy and democracy to create a distinctly American style. Martha and Abigail had focused almost exclusively on members of the social and political elite, and I think Dolly took a more open, expansive approach. Her good friend and architect Benjamin Latrobe once commented critically, and he was a friend, that although at her first drawing room Dolly hosted as first lady, she drew a crowd of respectable people. By the third round, he claimed it was a perfect rabble in beards and boots. So throughout our conversation, I've been thinking a lot about region and how region must have influenced the way that the first first ladies shaped the role of first lady. Because we began with Martha Washington, and you said that she lived her life mostly as an elite Virginian, and that's really how the Washingtons chose to live in the president's mansion. And then, of course, we explored the Adamses. Now, apart from their time in Europe, the Adamses spent most of their lives living in eastern Massachusetts, and boy, they were real Yankees. I mean, they were way less ostentatious and more frugal than the Washingtons. And then we talked about Dolly Madison, who, when you know her background, is just a bit different. Her husband, James, was an elite Virginian, but Dolly had been born in North Carolina and lived mostly in Virginia and Philadelphia. So she had, you know, a variety of experiences to prepare her for this role. So I have always found that place and region plays an important part in how it shapes people's identity and outlook. And I wonder, how did the regional backgrounds of the first first ladies really influence the ways that they shape the position of first lady? That's a very good question, Liz. First, I just want to make a comment. You mentioned the different styles of uh, James and Dolly Madison, and I think James Madison left to himself probably would have followed more in the footsteps of Adams and Jefferson. I think it was Dolly with her rather flamboyant personality. Remember, Madison was rather shy in public and reticent, and Dolly was his opposite, I would say. But let's get back to your question. I think their place of origin certainly had a significant impact. Martha Washington was born in 1731 in Virginia. Abigail Adams was over a decade younger than Martha. She was born in the Massachusetts colony in 1744. And Dolly Madison, as you mentioned, was born in North Carolina, but in 1768. So she was the youngest of the three women and literally a generation below Martha and Abigail. She grew up in Virginia, but her family moved to Philadelphia when she was 15. In the same year, the peace treaty to end the Revolutionary War was signed between America and England. Martha was possibly the, perhaps the least political of the three women because of A, encroaching old age, and B, possibly because of the common rigid views about public and private spheres for women in early 18th century Virginia. Historians have traditionally viewed Southern culture as a strict patriarchal society, although I should interject that newer research has suggested that patriarchy had its limits even in that region, and the stereotypical visions of white Southern privileged women who never ventured into the public arena is probably a myth. Abigail may have been the strongest and most outspoken political theorist of the three, not only because of innate intellect and personality, but also because in early New England, the patriarchal model there was more permeable and flexible, I would say, than other regions of the country. It appears that women, at least in that region of the early American colonies, were able to assert themselves to some degree in a variety of public and private roles within the larger social framework while still conforming to broader cultural norms. Men and women still had distinct roles within a hierarchy, but women there were seen as an essential and important part of the family unit, as historian John Demos demonstrated very ably many years ago. Dolly, who grew up during the American Revolution, may have been influenced by the enlarged roles some women experienced during the war, as well as aspects of her early Quaker roots. It's interesting to note that Quaker women in early America 
often possessed significant authority in their churches and communities. So all those background factors probably, likely, I would say, influenced how they viewed the role as First Lady and how they carried on. So we have three women with three different backgrounds with slightly different ideas of what was accepted of and even accepted from them by society. And I wonder, in what ways did you see these different backgrounds influence the ways that each woman shaped the position of First Lady? I think a lot of time was spent on trying to distance themselves from European models. So it was a really gradual evolution. I think that'll lead us possibly into the idea of the Republican court. I begin my book by describing the coronation of King George III and Queen Charlotte of England, which was marked by traditions that were developed in Europe really over many centuries. Both King George and Queen Charlotte were dressed in elaborate costumes decorated with valuable and glittering jewels and wore gold crowns. Essentially, like the president, the first ladies in the early republic had to figure out how to distance themselves from a royal style, but still command respect and bring gravitas to their husband's administrations without a crown or a throne. They had to model dignified behavior, really, for the new nation. In other words, Martha, Abigail, and Dolly all played a critical role in defining what we'd call a style of manners for the new federal government, which helped distinguish it from the old world royal courts in Europe. That's why really such seemingly unimportant gestures by Martha Washington, such as serving lemonade instead of fine wine, took on such significance and that what type of clothing they wore actually made a political statement. As you noted, this really does seem like a good place to talk about the Republican core, and that's exactly what we'll do after we take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor. Today's episode is sponsored by the Omohundro Institute. If you've been listening to this podcast for a while, then you know that since 1943, the OI has published award-winning books on early America and the leading journal on early American history, the Wayman Mary Quarterly. But the Omohundro Institute also has a more public side. If you're ever in the OI's home base of Williamsburg, Virginia, then you should be sure to check out their website for lectures, reading groups, and all sorts of other public programs. Visit benfranklinsworld.com slash OI events to learn more. Or better yet, sign up for the OI's newsletter so that you always know what's going on. You can sign up at benfranklinsworld.com slash OI news. Again, that's benfranklinsworld.com slash OI news. The Republican court is a subject that's come up a couple of times in our conversation. So, Jeannie, would you tell us about the Republican court and how the first first ladies were involved in it? That paradoxical institution, which at first glance really appears to be an oxymoron, a Republican and a court, was first launched by the Washingtons in 1789 in New York when that burgeoning urban center served as the first seat of the new government. The hosting of dinners, levees, and similar salon-like social events while Martha, Abigail, and Dolly served as first ladies not only called on their traditional robust domestic skills, but also allowed them to help shape public opinion and the social and political parameters of the new emerging republic. And that is what at times was known as the Republican court. And again, it was to differentiated from European courts. Martha and Abigail exhibited a more formal style in their quasi-courts, as I would think of it, but Dolly's court, so to speak, was more visibly accessible and open. She was really well-known for her crowded social events, which became highly popular, sometimes as many as 500 people at a time. And she circulated in the crowds instead of remaining formally seated, as did Martha and Abigail. But even the style of the two first ladies had evolved. Abigail, as I mentioned before, had experienced the French and English courts in Europe and had found them to be corrupt, opulent, extravagant. And she made a conscious effort to distance herself from the more rigid, stylized social practices she had encountered abroad. So that Republican court was a gradual evolution of how the social factors in the new administrations would play out. 
If we think about the English and French royal courts of the 18th century, we'll find that the people who attended court were really those of noble and elite birth. I mean, people attended the court when the monarchs demanded their presence, and then they left the court when the monarch had dismissed them. So how did the Republican court of the new United States work? Who was able to participate and attend the Republican court? And were there summonings and dismissals? That's a good question. And as you recall, I mentioned that both John and Abigail had participated in those royal courts. Abigail, again, in her very vivid correspondence related to her sister, what it was like to be presented to King George and Queen Charlotte, where she and the other people there had to wait in line for hours. I think she said three or four hours that all the people were lined up on the periphery of the room and that the monarchs just went one at a time, greeted people in the circle, and she had to be dressed in the highest of fashion, which, as you mentioned, she was very frugal. She grumbled about that, too, but she went ahead with it. In the United States, gradually, a different style of court developed. So Washington, in the beginning, had really planned on certain days to open his levies to anyone who came respectably dressed. And what he found after a short while is that he was busy all day with social events and couldn't really attend to government. So as time went on, things did become more stylized and formal. And again, I want to emphasize probably both in Washington's era and Adams's era, We're talking about basically the political and social elite who were invited to these events. It's probably too early to say that Dolly democratized her social events, but she certainly opened it to a wider audience. Again, huge numbers. And as Latrobe mentioned, it really ran the gamut from the very upper class to some more middle class people. Now, how long did these Republican courts remain a practice of presidential households and first ladies? I think gradually they dissolved in a certain way, but Americans became more comfortable. Certainly, they felt that the office of president had to be respected and have gravitas. And even today, of course, when foreign officials come to visit or important dinners at the White House, things are really sometimes extravagant as well. But we're going to move along eventually to the age of Jackson, where things will become a little simpler. But again, a president and the first lady, they realized from the beginning, while they were not kings and queens, they still had to garner the same respect as heads of state. So I think we wouldn't call it a Republican court anymore, but it certainly lasted at least for those first three presidents and their wives. It sounds like the courts were successful in lending the new government some gravitas. Is that what you found in your research? Correct. I believe it really did develop respect for the office, which was what they were all concerned about. Now, earlier you mentioned that Abigail Adams served as a one-woman cabinet for her husband, John. And Jeff would like to know if Martha Washington and Dolly Madison ever advised their husbands on matters of state and whether this is even something that we can know. Well, unfortunately, Martha destroyed nearly all her correspondence with her husband after he died, so we can't really garner, I would say, too much insight into her specific interactions on political matters. But we do know that George Washington certainly had discussed his military strategies with her during the Revolutionary War, and Martha was quite aware of the political issues in her husband's administration. And certainly the dissension between the Federalists and the Republicans. For example, after Washington died, she was very critical of Jefferson in a conversation with a visitor to Mount Vernon. And she was incensed at what she saw as his defection from the Federalists during Washington's second administration. Abigail, as I mentioned before, was her husband's most loyal supporter and advisor. So she did play a critical role and I think did have significant influence upon him. And Dolly Madison had a similar relationship with James Madison, even if she was not as well-read in political theory and philosophy as Abigail. For example, through her correspondence, largely with her sisters, 
We know that Madison kept Dolly apprised of events and strategy during the War of 1812, and they certainly discussed all of his political challenges and really often worked together as a team, certainly in terms of his political growth and elections. During our conversation, we've heard how both Martha Washington and Abigail Adams knew that they'd be in the public eye, but that neither of them really relished the experience. However, Dolly Madison did seem to enjoy being in the public spotlight. Jeannie, Carol wonders if you would tell us more about Madison's celebrity status, as it were, and why she seemed to be so interested in attracting attention. I think in Dolly's case, it was really a combination of her innate personality, opportunity, and her long-range goals for her husband, and by extension, the new nation. She was probably of the three the most naturally sociable in public, although Abigail was quite sociable as well. She was also a very adept public relations manager, although it wasn't called that at the time. Although privately, she may have preferred at times in her life to have stepped away from the limelight, especially in times of family loss and crisis. I feel that she knew her popularity and public presence could develop a strong base of support for her husband. And she, Dolly, really was very ambitious on his behalf. I think she was ahead of her time in understanding how media and personal political connections could move her husband's agenda forward, particularly historian Catherine Elgore in her very fine biography of Dolly has really demonstrated the especially critical role Dolly played in encouraging national unity in a very fragmented and fragile republic. And I also want to maybe interject, in the early days of the Republic, fashion made a political statement. Both Martha and Abigail had been careful to be elegant but restrained in their dress so as not to invoke comparison with the hated monarchy in Europe from Republican adherents. Most people found the flamboyant Dolly to have exuded a high style that was both commensurate with the dignity and importance of her position but still was distinguished from European queens. For example, she was famous for the elaborate turbans and plumed headdresses she wore, but it was not a crown. And at her crowded drawing rooms, the tall statuesque dolly could be easily seen from all over the room. The headgear was certainly eye-catching, but again, not a crown. Those who supported dolly and basically were Republicans, like her friend Margaret Bayard Smith, insisted that it was absolutely impossible for anyone to behave with more perfect propriety than Dolly did. But some critics actually found Dolly lacking in sophistication and good taste. It sounds like in many ways, Dolly benefited from the fact that she was 12 years removed from Martha Washington as First Lady, and that by the time she became First Lady, times in American ideas about Europe and what the United States needed to be as a republic had really shifted and changed. Well, still through the Madison's time, I think Americans were trying to demonstrate that the United States was an independent nation, that it needed to be regarded as an important nation and state. And I think that things maybe gradually relaxed a bit, but all three administrations were still trying to prove themselves to European nations, often considered the United States an upstart, inferior country. When we think about the role of the First Lady of the United States today, many of us expect that the First Lady is going to serve as a champion of the cause and as a key piece of her president's public relations team, you know, which we just learned about in this conversation is a job that we can date back to Abigail Adams and Dolly Madison. Now, Jeannie, would you tell us whether the first First Ladies had any causes that they championed and how the actions and duties of these first First Ladies really molded the position into the role that we know today? Let me reiterate, in their own ways, Martha, Abigail, and Dolly were all significant public relations representatives on behalf of their husband's presidential administrations. Even though it may not have been her preference, even Martha Washington capably oversaw social events that raised her husband's profile and popularity. She was very protective of him and his health. And she realized that she wanted to make a good impression to raise his reputation in the nation. 
Abigail did the same, but went further as an advocate for John's policy through granting interviews with the press and in her conversations and correspondence with political figures and friends and family members. And as we saw before, Dolly certainly viewed herself as a key player in her husband's political campaigns and administrative goals. And to answer your second part of the question, all three of our inaugural First Ladies championed a cause. Martha advocated for pensions and financial support for Revolutionary War veterans, which raised her husband's reputation, incidentally, as well. Abigail more privately supported members of her local community in times of sickness and hardship. And Dolly Madison was the funder, founder, fundraiser, and staunch supporter of the Washington City Orphan Asylum. Although she was undoubtedly motivated in part by altruism, with her talent for publicity, I really think Dolly realized that her charity work added to her celebrity and reputation, and by extension, that of her husband. In any case, she certainly modeled philanthropic volunteerism for future generations of First Ladies. Over time, certainly other First Ladies have outshined them. Eleanor Roosevelt comes most notably to mind for her championship of civil rights. Now we should move into the time warp, which you may remember is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. One of the big points that Jeannie makes in First Ladies of the Republic is that the social events organized by Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, and Dolly Madison were instrumental in the development of a distinctive American political style and a distinctive American cultural unity. She notes that these events served as the crucibles in which the ideas of male politicians were tested. Jeannie, in your opinion, what might have happened if the first First Ladies had not hosted or guided these social gatherings? How might the political developments of the early republic and the new nation have been different? Well, to begin with, in this day and age, it's really hard for us to imagine what it was like without instant communication through television, radio, the internet, and Twitter. In their era, one-on-one, face-to-face interactions were essential to the development of the new American government. We need to recall that the creation of the United States was a grand experiment and that the founders were feeling their way in every area. The social events were not inconsequential as they provided a forum for developing networks, a plan to move forward, and helped move disparate groups together. Really, many early Americans still saw their state almost as a separate country without these ceremonial occasions and more informal interactions that served as what I would call leavening agents. That very fragile union might have unraveled. We might have had something similar to the European Union. And women played a critical role in creating the opportunity to really launch and cement those new necessary relationships that helped unify the nation. So, Jeannie, your last two books have involved the founding mothers and fathers. Are you researching and writing a third book about them? I am, in a way. As you, I'm sure, saw from the interview, I have been very drawn to the lives of Abigail and John Adams especially. Right now, I've begun working on a book that will focus on their journeys to Europe and how their time abroad influenced their political and social thought. If we have more questions about the first First Ladies and how they shaped the position of First Lady, how can we pose them to you? I'm happy to have people correspond through my email. It's pretty self-evident email, but it's genie.abrams at du.edu. Jeannie Abrams, thank you so much for rejoining us and for taking the time to help us explore the lives and accomplishments of the first First Ladies. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here. Although the term First Lady only came into regular use with Mary Todd Lincoln during the 1860s, presidential spouses have filled the position of First Lady and played important roles in presidential administrations since the start of the presidency. As Ginny related, Martha Washington set the tone for the position. She looked to bring dignity and respect to the new government by eschewing all the trappings and extravagance of the royal courts of Europe. Europe may have had monarchies, but the United States had a republic and Martha Washington helps set the tone for what the executive household of that republic should look like and how it should act. 
Of course, as Jeannie revealed, Martha may have set the tone, but there was some variation in the Republican look of the executive household. For example, Martha and George Washington were members of the Virginia elite. They had enslaved servants and money, and while they did live in a Republican manner, that manner was more ostentatious than that of John and Abigail Adams. The Adams's wealth was different from the Washington's wealth, and their regional culture prompted them to implement a Republican style that was more in line with Yankee values of thrift and frugality. Of course, still more different, and probably falling in between the Republican styles of the Washingtons and Adamses, was the Republican style of the Madisons. Dolly's Quaker roots and time in Virginia and Philadelphia really influenced her ideas of what Republican style should look like. Now, although there were differences in how they viewed Republican style, all three of the first first ladies set the tone for their involvement in their husbands' administrations. And in all three cases, that tone was an involvement in politics. Martha Washington exercised her politics carefully. She likely served as a behind-the-scenes political advisor to her husband, and she actively served as a public champion of the political causes of Revolutionary War veterans. Abigail Adams was more outspoken. She held her own press conferences where she talked about politics, and she actively advised her husband on political matters as though she were serving as his one-woman cabinet. Likewise, Dolly Madison also played an active and public role in politics. Madison championed and furthered the cause of the Washington City Orphanage, and she used the need of the new capital city for a social life to host parties that allowed her to actively politic on behalf of her husband. But regardless of their differences in style and politics, Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, and Dolly Madison each played an important and influential role in bringing gravitas and respect to the new nation's government. And they did their part by carefully considering and setting examples of how good Republican citizens should look and act. You'll find more information about Jeannie, her book, First Ladies of the Republic, plus notes for what we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 205. The Omohundro Institute isn't just the publisher of award-winning books and articles. They're a first-class host of public events about history. If you live near Williamsburg, Virginia, or you intend to make plans to visit that center of early American history, you should check out the OI's public events. And you can do this by visiting benfranklinsworld.com slash OI events, or you could sign up for the OI newsletter at benfranklinsworld.com slash OI news, and you will always stay informed. This episode benefited from the production assistance of Holly White. Did you know that Holly's a historian too, and that you can meet her and say hello in the Ben Franklin's World listener community on Facebook? If you're in the community, please introduce yourself to Holly. And if you're not in the community, text BF World 233444 and come join us. Finally, today's episode featured a topic from women's history. What more about early American women's history would you like to know about? Let me know, because I'm always looking for ways to explore your interests and answer your questions. So send me your topics, liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.